church in Brampton. Who else was surprised when they woke up this morning and saw flurries? Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Um, not exactly April weather, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm so very glad, so very blessed that so many people have chosen to be here in person, also for people who are joining us online. I'm the Reverend Tom McNeil, and together with leadership from the New Directions Choir, we'll be leading you in worship for the next hour. We're going to begin this week by acknowledging the lands on which we gather and on which we worship. And together we acknowledge the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat First Nations, on whose ancient and sacred land we live, work, and play. We pay respect to their elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We recognize the systemic inequities that stem from past and present wrongdoings, and we commit ourselves to naming, understanding, and reconciling this long history of injustice. And next we are going to open our worship with our opening hymn, Voices United number 264, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
let us join our voices together in the call to worship. We come to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed. We come to offer tithes to God. Let our offerings be blessed and reach out beyond the walls of our church and into our community. We come to offer our worship to God. Let our songs of hallelujah echo throughout the world. Let our prayers be lifted up to heaven as the sweet fragrance of our let us worship God. When we arrived this morning, we entered into the normal bustle of a church on a Sunday morning. Friends greeting friends, choir members rehearsing their songs, all of us bringing energy and enthusiasm. Now that we are sitting in our pews, I invite you to close your eyes. Consider the word sanctuary. A sanctuary is a place set aside for sacred things. It is a place of refuge and protection. This room is a sanctuary. The season of Lent is a kind of sanctuary extended in time. And one of the things that Lent teaches you is that you, too, are a sanctuary. There is inside you a place for sacred things, a place where God abides. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of war and oppression in the world. Let us pray. Loving God, we open our hearts to you. We invite you into our inmost being only to find you are already there. Strengthen us in our quiet places, and then lead us into the work of justice and peace. Amen. Now's the time that, if you're feeling a little bit uh, younger at heart, we're going to share a story. And this story comes from the Gospel of John. Pilate tried his best to pardon Jesus, but the Jews shouted him down, If you pardon this man, you're no friend of Caesar's. Anyone setting himself up as king defies Caesar. Now, when Pilate heard these words, he led Jesus outside. He sat down at the judgment seat in the area designated in the stone court in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day for Passover. The hour was noon. Peter said to those assembled, Here is your king. They shouted back, Kill him! Kill him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Am I to crucify your king? The high priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a kind of weird story. The Messiah that everyone had been praying for, the Messiah that would liberate Israel from Rome is here, and the leaders are saying, oh no, we have no king but the Roman emperor. Kind of makes you do a double take. Kind of like in those cartoons when something really surprising happens, and 
the character just shakes his head back and forth and his eyes bulge out. And it's such a surprise to hear this. And you would think, you would think after all this, that would be it. And God would say, all right, I can't do anymore. And yet the surprising thing is, the story carries on. And we find out God is not done. We find out that the most incredible thing that God has ever done is about to happen. And what that surprising thing is, well, you're going to have to stay tuned. But we remember that despite everything that may happen, God is never done with us. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the faith that you have in us, even when we sometimes don't have that faith in ourselves. We thank you that you always come to us and that you are always willing to welcome us back into heaven, to welcome us back into that wonderful state of grace with you. God, help us. Lead us to that state of grace. Ignite that passion in our souls that will make us hunger after you. And help us in the coming days to proclaim that you alone are our king. You alone lead us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next hymn comes from Voices United, number 121, Tree of Life and Awesome Mystery. Lazarus was among those who ate with him. 
Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. So we've been spending our Lenten time, this period of time before Easter, looking at ways to come together for God's sake, for the sake of God's work, of God's kingdom, of God's vision for how the world can be. And we know that the world is, is trying to distract us and pull us away from that, but God is always drawing us into that better place, into that 
greater awareness of what's going on and ways that we can work in harmony with God. The world tempts us, tempts us with idols and with power. But Jesus gives us an example of what it is to live for God and only for God, not for ourselves, not for our own vain glory, but to really live for God. God invites us to go out to the margins, to the edges of society, and invite those people to the feast. God invites us to share mercy with one another. And through all of this, God is changing us, changing us so that we want to come together more. And today, we're looking at a group that has come together. And it's this group of people who came together for this feast. Just before this passage, we hear that remarkable story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And here we are in the house of Lazarus' sister, Martha. Lazarus is there. Martha and Mary are there. The disciples are all there. It's, it's a great feast. And we pick up on two main characters from this. On Mary and Judas. And what are they showing us in this? Our narrative begins in the aftermath of this meal. Now, Martha was deeply moved by the loss of her brother Lazarus. And so for Lazarus to be raised back to life, I mean, this was a celebration like no other. Normally, a dinner might consist of some vegetables, maybe some bread, and the bread might not be the highest quality bread. Um, but this, this meal, I mean, there would have been a wide selection of vegetables. The bread would have been the best bread possible. There would even have been red meat. Ooh. And Martha, I, I think she might still live on today as Martha Stewart, because this was someone who could really throw a party. This was someone who knew how to, how to really cook and present everything. I mean, think of the best party you've been to and then amp that up. This was the kind of feast that Jesus and his followers sat down to. It was a huge meal. And at the end of the meal, well, I mean, we've all been to big family meals. And we all know that at the end of it, we need to let the belts out a little bit. Because we've usually eaten a bit more than we otherwise would. Cooking's just so good. And we don't know. I mean, this kind of meal would have been a really costly affair to put together. Now, John, as he's writing about this, isn't recording what the cost was, but this was certainly going to put a hole in whatever savings that Martha had. There was a lot of money that went into this stumptious feast. We hear that Lazarus is there. Uh, in, in one translation it says that he sat. In another translation it says that he reclined. And I think at this point in the meal, pretty much everyone was reclining. They were, they were laid out. And into this comes Mary. Not Jesus' mother. This is a different Mary. But she comes in with this small vial of perfume, about the size of a small coffee cup. She comes in and she cracks it. And the smell of that perfume, it would have been a, a solid jar. So to open it, she had to break it. And that smell would have escaped that earthenware pot. And it filled the room and that wonderful meal, as good as it was, and as, as much as people were still enjoying it, that fragrant scent 
spread throughout. Everyone could smell it. And everyone would have recognized that as nard. Now, nard, I found out, what they're referring to here, it was a, a plant that blossomed in the Himalayas. Now think of the geography here. We're in Israel. The Himalayas, sorry, I'll do it reverse. The Himalayas are, are way out in Asia. It would have been expensive perfume. This was not your dollar store variety. This was top shelf perfume. Most Bibles record Judah saying, that was 300 denarii. The translation that we heard from today actually adjusted that for inflation, did all the cash conversions, and said, that's a year's worth of wages. This was a $60,000 bottle of perfume. And the whole thing gets cracked open and poured on Jesus' feet. Feet that were worn, cracked, dusty. And to ensure that not a drop of this perfume goes to waste, Mary takes her own hair and massages it in. This perfume, it wasn't just something to, to make things smell nice, but it was something to help nourish the skin. Skin that was chapped. The blisters, the calluses. To help provide some relief to Jesus, who had come to provide so much relief to the whole world. And here's Mary offering back to Jesus in the best way that she can, the year's worth of wages. Judas, oh Judas, he jumps on her. What are you doing? That's, the, do you not know how many people could have been helped with that perfume? With the money that you spent on that perfume? Are you crazy? What are you doing? Now, John had a less than favorable impression of Judas. He, he believed that Judas stole a lot of money from the communal purse, and that if that 300 denarii had gone into the communal purse, some of that would have gone into Judas's purse. So, yes, of course, Judas is very interested in that money going to the poor. Judas wanted to hoard everything. And let's not forget, regardless of his motives, whether John was right or wrong, Judas was being very practical here. I mean, think, this, this dinner was not small change. This dinner had cost a lot of money, and he didn't seem to have a huge problem with the dinner, that dinner that he had enjoyed. This perfume being lavished on Jesus. Now, hold on a minute. Can we really afford this expense? Judas says. And he's coming at it from a very practical point of view. And I think sometimes we can kind of relate. Sometimes we might be a little more practical than we should be. We wonder if we're making good investments with our limited resources. And the world makes us think, oh, well, you've only got so much. There's only so much you can do, so make sure you do the right thing. And oftentimes, the criteria by which we judge is this the right thing is how well does it meet our needs? Are we, are we taking care of this so that it will be there for us, us, tomorrow. And oftentimes we end up saving so much of our resources for a rainy day. Now, I don't want to say that we should all just splurge and, and spend every dime we get as soon as we get it. No, we have to be good stewards. But what I am saying is sometimes we might go a little too far on that stewarding. None of us are, are exactly flush with resources. We do have to be concerned with where our money is going and where our time is going and our gifts being used in the best way possible. But we might be a little over-practical with that. 
I'm guilty of this as well. Uh, when it comes to getting gifts and, and toys for Jacob, Angela would get him everything and everything that she could. I sometimes wonder, wait, does he need another art table? He's already got two. <laughs> wait, that, that toy that you're getting for him, honey, um, that's, that's going to be good for him when he's three. That's a little bit down the road. Do we have to get it right now? And I'll admit, sometimes I am really, really super practical on it. But Angela, Angela would shower Jacob with gifts. Everything that she could give would be for him. Kind of like what we hear with Mary and Jesus. That year's worth of wages in that one little jar that is now all over Jesus' feet. Mary pouring out everything. And as, as I hear this story, I, I think back to another story in the Bible about another pair of people. One would offer sacrifices to God, and God would accept those sacrifices. The other one offered sacrifices to God, and God did not accept. And the wording that's used there implies that God, it's not that God didn't like what was being sacrificed, but God didn't like why it was being sacrificed. God didn't like this second person's motives. And of course, I'm talking about that first brotherly feud in the Bible between Cain and Abel. Abel offering up the grains, the first fruit of his harvest. Cain, a shepherd, offering up the first fruit of his harvest. But God not accepting it, not because God was really liking the grains and didn't feel like a steak that day, more that God did not like the motives. Cain was trying to keep in step, and so what was Cain's reaction? Get rid of his brother. And you can kind of see that here. Mary offering freely and fully. Judas being measured in what he's doing. And what does he do? He takes down Mary's offering. He says that offering is not good enough. It's not right. And another thing that I hear in this, the fragrance of Mary's offering. Oftentimes when we hear about the sacrifices at the temple and the smoke being a fragrance that's lifted up to God, that scent, that smell that goes up into heaven. We see these things being played out time and time again. There's always those people who are willing to give everything, and then the people who are a bit more measured, and the people who are a bit more measured usually don't come out in the best light, because God wants us to share everything that we've got. God wants us to give freely and from the heart to lift other people up. Jesus here, he says that you will always have poor, but you won't always have me. And we might think that this is kind of Jesus lifting himself up above the poor. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. I think he's rather talking about the urgency this is six days before the Passover, the Passover where Jesus will be crucified. Jesus isn't going to be around his disciples for too much longer. It's really urgent that you act, and you act now. As for us, I don't think we have to worry so much about a window of opportunity closing as much as the sooner we start acting, the more that we're going to be able to do. And I also hear... Jesus standing in solidarity with the poor. That how we take care of Jesus is how we take care of the poor. Or perhaps we need to hear that in reverse. How we take care of the poor is how we take care of Jesus. Do we offer freely and totally? Not necessarily recklessly. But do we offer out of our abundance to those who don't have enough. 
Over the past few weeks, we've had the opportunity to share out of our abundance with the people who benefit from Regen. And we're going to see just a small portion of what's been donated later on in the service, and we'll be blessing that with our offering. But what we hear from Jesus here is not a call for expensive ornamentation, that we have to necessarily buy expensive perfume and give it. The real work of Jesus here is in helping the poor, helping the economically poor, and also helping the spiritually poor. This is world-changing work that Jesus is calling us to do. And it challenges that idea that we have to be totally self-sufficient and totally practical. It challenges that in a way that might make us a little uncomfortable. But it's, it's also such a good work to be involved in. offer freely to offer everything. Mary got nothing back from what she did. She massaged every drop of oil into Jesus' feet. She squeezed her hair out so that none went to waste. And it's very much like a parent showing that love for a child, that love that knows no bounds. And to be fair, I might not spoil Jacob with a whole bunch of toys, but I spoil him in every other way that I possibly can. And every parent does that. Every parent wants their child to know a good life, to know a happy life. And we share that love with everyone that we meet. And especially, we share it with the poor those who don't have enough, we share out of our abundance that they may know happiness as well. We need to resist that Judas-like temptation to hoard things, to think that we have to be self-sufficient. We have to resist that and we have to share out of our abundance. We have to be like Mary and recognize that if Jesus is worth sharing everything with the poor with whom he stands in solidarity are worth sharing everything as well. And so we, we go out to share what we have with others, to share our time, to share our talents, to share of our wealth with others. So I challenge everyone this week, think of something extra that you can offer. Now, it might be a, a nice check going off to mission and service or to regen or, or something else. Or it might be simple acts of kindness, holding the door for people. I think we can do that again. Whatever it might be, might we do it with the same love that Mary showed Jesus, that love that gives everything and expects nothing in return. Let's pray. Holy God, you've given us so much abundance, and we give thanks for it. We give our, our gratitude, but we also recognize that sometimes we hoard, and, and sometimes maybe we hold a little too much back. We are thankful, though, that you never hold anything back, that you love us so much love us and you show us that the blessings that you shower on us, blessings of friendship, blessings of community, blessings of, of time spent in your presence. And we ask God going forward for the grace to share those blessings with others, to extend that love, to extend all that we have to other people, to lift them up so that all may share in the bounty of your kingdom for the sake of that incredible kingdom where all are welcome, a kingdom of justice, a kingdom of mercy, and a kingdom of humility. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our next hymn comes from Voices United, number 593. Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. mission and service, you may be thinking about the projects that we have in far-off lands, but actually, mission and service benefits some things in our local community, things like this. Nothing prepares us to lose the ones we love most in the world. Lisa's husband, Steve, was in and out of palliative care for years. I've been journeying with my husband's end of life for almost three years, actually. And it was a very difficult journey. He wasn't ready to leave this life. Just the week before he died, I remember him saying, I'll surprise you yet. Next week, you'll see me walking around that circle with my cane. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. After Steve died, Lisa attended a widow's support circle facilitated by Aura, a mission and service partner. Aura, meaning life in Maori, helps people move through grief and loss through workshops and support circles. Hearing the story shared, the wisdom shared, the laughter and tears brought me to a place where I, was, I felt comfortable in, in sharing a bit of my own pain and my own journey. And there was this sense of solidarity in our pain, um, a companionship and an understanding that surpassed uh, my different other networks of resource. Uh, because being a widow is, 
a different kind of loss than, you know, losing a parent or losing a child or losing a friend. Your gifts through mission and service help people like Lisa rebuild their lives after loss. Or uh, just like other outreach ministries that we have. Our ways are tangible ways of showing our faith in action. Uh, my story is one of a gazillion stories of how some of these initiatives really impact the communities where they're planted. One of the most difficult times of my life, you provided care and love and comfort. Indeed, we are not alone. We live in God's world. Thank you. So gifts to mission and service can be made, as well as gifts to the local congregation through these envelopes that you might find in your pews. They can be made uh, they can be dropped off at the mail slot just off the parking lot. They can be mailed into the church at the address that was that's there on the screen. Or for those of you who are a little bit more technically minded, there is a link in the description to this video where you can also make your offerings. But however your offerings are given, we receive them with grace. Gen over the last two weeks. And so in our offering today, we're going to bless this. These are the kinds of goods that people need desperately today. So we'll be blessing this and also the offerings that we have received. Our offering here this morning represents only a fraction of our wealth. May we aspire to be like Mary, offering her whole self to God. May God be safe and do support making the kingdom of heaven a reality here on earth, with milk and honey for all. Amen. us to share in the prayers of the people. As Mary gave her best to Jesus, we strive to give our best to the world. We pray for peaceful resolutions to conflicts throughout the world, especially in Ukraine. We pray that medical resources can be safely and quickly distributed to developing nations. We pray that we may be wise stewards of the Earth's natural resources. We offer our best, the first fruits of our labor. May its effects spread far and wide, like a fragrant perfume. As Mary gave her best to Jesus, we strive to give our best to our community. We pray for an end to the toxic masculinity that dehumanizes women and men 
into simple roles to be played. We pray for constructive dialogue between political parties that would help our society to heal from partisan identity politics. We pray for arts to be lifted up as essential expressions of ourselves and not frivolous extras in our lives. We offer our best, the first fruits of our labor. May its effects spread far and wide like a fragrant perfume. As Mary gave her best to Jesus, we strive to give our best to the church. We pray for the communities of faith at Caledon East United Church, Glebe Road United Church in Toronto, Grace United Church in Brampton, and Pioneer Memorial United Church in Hillside. We pray for the work of candidacy boards throughout the United Church of Canada as they help candidates for ministry to discern their gifts and talents. We pray that congregations everywhere of all denominations might come together to offer their gifts for the sake of your kingdom. We offer our best, the first fruits of our labor, as Mary gave her best to Jesus, we strive to give our best. We offer you our time and talents, that they might be used to further the spread of your justice. We offer you our hearts and minds, that they may be instruments of your mercy. We offer you our lives, that they may be examples of humility to others. We offer our best, the first fruits of our labor. May its effects spread far and wide, like a fragrant perfume. We offer these and all our prayers to you, O God, as to our Mother who loves us, as to... some of the life and work at Emmanuel United Church. Our prayers go out to Marg and Jim Benzi and to their whole family on the passing of Marg's mother, Betty. Uh, our prayers are with Warren Simpson and his family as he begins his end-of-life preparations. Our prayers are also with Lori Melnick and her family on the passing of her aunt in Ottawa with Esther Hunter, who is in the hospital, and with Carolyn Sullivan's daughter, Suzanne Marie Howlett, who is battling cancer. Uh, we do have some celebrations uh, for Jean and Doug Ford's first grandchild, and uh, Eric Ford's first nephew. We'll, we'll throw that in there. Uh, 
he was born last Sunday, and we were wondering if we were going to squeeze that into the announcements last Sunday, but uh, proud parents Jessica Crows and uh, Brian Ford are doing well, as is the baby. Uh, we give thanks for the successful operation for Lori Melnick's uncle and pray for his continued recovery. Uh, and we continue to pray for Jim Carruthers as he continues to recover from the stroke at home. Uh, sip and Talk is back, and we are actually sipping like we were last week. So after service, you can head down to the Fellowship Hall, and uh, there will be coffee available there, and it's still only coffee, right? Coffee and tea, but we're, we're only sipping, we're not nibbling. No nibble and talk, just sip and talk. Uh, men's Club is selling fair trade coffee, uh, $15 for a pound of coffee, or two for 25, and you can see Mario Fenoro to order. Uh, the UCW general meeting will be in person on Thursday, April the 7th, that is this Thursday at 1 p.m., and please contact Diane if you need a ride. Uh, if you are struggling from the isolation and fear of COVID, as I'm sure many people are, please reach out to your doctor, your minister, teacher, or another professional, or a good friend. Let's support each other through these times. Seasoned with Love, a Zoom cooking class, is going to be next weekend. Um, experience Kenyan culture through cooking that will support uh, the women of uh, Kibera, or Kibera, Kenya, uh, who take AIDS orphan children in and care for them. Uh, it will be next Saturday and Sunday, and you can go to villageoflovecanada.org for information and to register. I believe that to be, oh no, wait. The flowers, yes, thank you. The flowers are from uh, Betty Osborne's funeral yesterday. Uh, we were able to celebrate her life. That's one, and there's also the one on the uh, organ, but you'd have to be here in the sanctuary to see it. <laughs> so come on out, guys, come on out. Uh, and also, Holy Week services. Uh, there will be a Monday Thursday service on the 14th, it is the 14th of April, and that will, we will gather at six o'clock for a service, a dinner service to start at 6.30. We will have a Good Friday service on the 15th at 11 a.m., so our normal worship time. That will be streamed. Our Monday, Thursday won't be streamed. And, of course, on the 17th of April, there's going to be an Easter service. So come on out or join us online, however you are comfortable. I'd love to see a really... This, this is a fairly full sanctuary, but I wonder, I wonder how many more people we can invite, either in person or online, to be a part of Easter. So think about that and, and think about who we might be able to invite. I believe that is all the announcements. Yes, okay. Uh, then I will change the Christ candle, knowing that it's never extinguished. But as Christ went from being in one place to being in many, so too the light of this candle spreads throughout the world as a fragrant perfume. And know that wherever you go this week, you go in the light of Christ. And I'll invite everyone to join in the benediction. May we go and offer all we have to God's vision for the world. A world where justice is more valuable than expensive perfume. A world where mercy spreads out like a sweet fragrance. A world where everyone humbly seeks and follows God into the margins. Amen. And our closing hymn this week is Voices United, number 327, All Praise to Thee. Oh.